Hi there, Dr. Terry Shaneyfelt for UAB Department of Medicine. In this video, I'm going to discuss my thoughts on who needs preoperative non-invasive cardiac testing. And I really think almost no one. I'm going to show some data in the next two slides to support that. But that being said, studies have shown that various cardiac stress testing modalities like dobutamine echo and thallium stress tests have a very good negative predictive value, but a pretty poor positive predictive value in determining who will have a cardiac complication from non-cardiac surgery. So these tests are much better when they're negative than when they're positive. So this is a study done by Poldermans who randomized patients to a strategy of testing versus no testing prior to non-cardiac surgery. And the outcome of interest was cardiac death or myocardial infarction. And what he found was no significant difference in outcomes of whether patients underwent testing or not. So it didn't matter whether you tested them and, and acted on what you found. It didn't seem to reduce cardiac death or myocardial infarction. So what about if you did do testing and you find something? Does it matter whether you fix it or not prior to surgery? So it doesn't seem so based on the CARP trial that I show here published by McFalls and colleagues. And in this study, they randomized patients who are undergoing vascular surgery. And vascular surgery is the highest risk surgery from a cardiac standpoint, uh, short, short of uh, cardiac surgery itself. And they randomized them to either undergo revascularization, either by cabbage or PCI, or to optimal medical therapy with no revascularization. What you can see here for survival, these curves are basically superimposed. There was no difference in survival if patients underwent revascularization or not. And these are all very high risk patients. So testing and acting upon it doesn't really seem to matter. So the American College of Cardiology published a guideline in 2014 on the perioperative evaluation and management of cardiac risk prior to non-cardiac surgery. And I want to go through the management aspect of it here. So you'll estimate a patient's risk of major adverse cardiovascular events using either the revised cardiac risk index or the GUPTA tool, and patients will either be low risk or high risk. If patients are low risk and have a less than 1% risk of MACE, then you do no further testing. They go directly to surgery. If patients are high risk, then you have to do an assessment of their functional capacity. And if patients can achieve greater than four METs of functional capacity, then they're good to go. You need no further testing and they can proceed to surgery. They're going to be at very low risk of having any cardiovascular events. But what about patients who you can't assess their functional capacity? They may have other diseases or arthritis, which limits their functional ability. Or you do a functional capacity assessment, you find they don't ever get to that 4-MET threshold. We have to make a decision here. You have to decide if further testing will really change management and improve outcomes. I wish the, the authors of this guideline would have been a little bit more explicit with that in this diagram because in the text supporting it, they talk about and stress that you should only test if it's going to change management. And in most cases, the answer is going to be no and you can proceed to surgery just with optimal medical therapy. But if for some reason you think that testing and potential revascularization might matter, it's interesting that they recommend in this figure doing pharmacologic stress testing because in the text of it, they really stress doing exercise testing over pharmacologic testing because of the prognostic ability of being able to achieve 7 to 10 METs with an exercise test. And patients who can do that have a very low risk of perioperative events. And people who can achieve that have increased risk of cardiovascular events. So Pharmacologic stress testing should really be reserved for patients who can't exercise or have poorly interpretable EKGs. And a moderate or large area of ischemia is associated with increased risk of perioperative MI and death. A normal study has a very good negative predictive value, as I mentioned earlier. But there are no comparative randomized controlled trials for me to help you pick which stress testing modality you should use. I can't tell you whether you should do a dobutamine stress echo or a dipyridamol or regadenosine myocardial perfusion imaging study. I just can't give you that specific um, recommendation based on any studies. So if you find their functional capacity is poor and you decide that you're going to do further testing, you need to really think about will it change the surgical decision or improve outcomes. And if that is the case and they undergo pharmacologic stress testing, if it comes out to be normal, then patients can proceed to surgery. If it's abnormal, then you got to think about doing revascularization according to indications um, from guidelines. And this is a really important thing because you really need to think about the implications of that decision. It's going to delay their surgery, at least by the time it takes to recover from a cabbage, 
And if you put a stent in, you have to remember there's going to be a period of time you have to do dual antiplatelet therapy. And it's going to be even longer if you have to do it for a drug-eluting stent. So you really need to think about this, talk with the patients, talk with the surgeons about this implication prior to surgery. Because really, as I showed earlier, there's not a lot of benefit of revascularizing people um, preoperatively to prevent perioperative outcomes. So keep in mind that the indications for coronary angiography and revascularization are going to be the same in the preoperative as in uh, non-operative settings. So we don't want to change our decision making just because somebody's undergoing surgery. So what about assessing LV function? Well, studies have demonstrated there's a strong association between reduced LV systolic function and perioperative compli complications. And if you look at the revised cardiac risk index, CHF is an important risk factor included in that tool. But despite this, the American College of Cardiology only recommends um, doing LV assessment in really two settings. Number one, in patients who have dyspnea, who we don't know the cause of that, and patients who have heart failure, who have worsening symptoms. Those are really the only two times that you ought to really consider doing an assessment of LV function. There's no benefit of doing routine preoperative evaluation of LV function. It doesn't really um, help or predict anything. It just increases costs. So my thoughts are how you should approach this is I try to ignore the planned surgery. I take it out of the picture. And if I'm seeing this patient in primary care, I look at them as a patient not undergoing surgery. And I think about would I do further evaluation of them irrespective of surgery. If my answer is no, then there's no reason to work them up um, prior to surgery. Preoperative testing and then revascularization really needs to be um, limited to the people who are going to gain benefit from this independent of surgery, similar theme. So only the people who would gain benefit anyway are the only ones we should be doing this in. And really think about will any testing that you do change management? If the answer is no, don't do it. And it, in most cases the answer will be no and most patients will be able to go to surgery fine just with optimal uh, medical therapy.